Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Crime and Entertainment. We have here today a very special guest. I stumbled upon a podcast. I reached out to Jimmy Chogger Jr. And I was wanting to interview him after I was digging into his father. Uh, this coming off the heels of digging into the cocaine bear story. And he asked me if I'd ever heard a podcast called Son of a Hitman. And I told him, no, I had not. And he's like, you really need to check it out. It'll give you a lot of background info, you know, some of my father, but also Charles Harrelson, uh, father of famous Hollywood actor, Woody Harrelson, who is supposedly the man responsible for killing a federal judge. And, uh, depending on who you believe, possibly a part in the JFK assassination and son of a Hitman was an absolute fabulous podcast. So I was able to track down the guy that put that together. Mr. Jason Cavanaugh, Jason, how you doing my friend? Good. Thanks for having me. So I, first off, tell us, tell our audience a little bit, kind of give us a little primer. Who is Jason Cavanaugh? So I'm a television producer. I've been doing it for 18 years now. Uh, work in documentary reality, uh, docuseries, some comedy here and there. Um, and yeah, I've been doing that for a long time. And this podcast was my first, my first time doing an, just an audio only project doing a podcast um, but happy with the way it turned out, had a good time doing it I mean, for it to be audio only. It really felt like I was there in some of those conversations. And I don't know if that was just the background music that was going on or just the whole tone of the story, but you know, typically I like video. Um, if I have the choice of watching the same thing or hearing it, you know, just audio, I like video, but I really enjoyed this and even though you weren't able to see it it was like you could put yourself in that conversation how did this whole situation come about for you to do this podcast sure so i mean just going back to what you said feeling like you were there that was actually something we set out to do was to make it feel almost cinematic right um the way you pulled it off <laughs> yeah so that it's not just listening to an interview but that you're actually you know you're getting the like entrance into a place you get the the feel of okay we're in a bar here we're in a diner here um we're walking into somebody's house whatever it is but to hear the sort of organic um play so it's a scene rather than just an interview right. um was something we set out to do and that was i think you know the people who were involved in this it was myself um a friend of mine who i had known from the time we were production assistants together at mtv back like 18 years ago we had met and uh on the show made, which is like a high school kid, you know, wants to learn to skateboard or whatever, you know? Um, and so we were production assistants on that show. I went on to do more production type stuff, you know, worked my way up to being a showrunner in television. My friend went the development route where he was working as a development executive, you know, coming up with ideas for shows, that sort of a thing. And uh, at some point he came across this, this, you know, the rumor that Woody Harrelson's dad killed JFK. And he's like, well, that sounds like bullshit, but let me look into it, you know? And so he looked into that rumor and then he's like, all right, he, you know, that's a rumor, but he did in fact kill a federal judge. He was convicted for killing a federal judge uh, in 1979 and went to supermax prison, spent the rest of his life in prison for that. Um, so my friend, Andrew Jacobs is his name. He's another producer. Um, he reached out to Brett Harrelson. First, he reached out to Woody's people. They were like, don't ask. Yeah. So he then he then tracked down Brett Harrelson, who's Woody's younger brother. And uh, Brett was like, yeah, happy to talk about it. And in fact, um, Brett was the only one who had actually lived with his dad for any period of time. When he was 16 years old, he went and lived with them in, uh, in Texas. And, you know, it was actually the year before... Charles allegedly killed this federal judge. Brett lived with so him. That would be and like 78. 78, 79. Yeah, like sometime around then. Brett was 16. He said he saw suitcases filled with cash, yeah. saw guns. His dad always had a gun on him. Um, so yeah, I mean, he was he he sort of lived it. He was around for it. And so, you know, Andrew spoke to Brett. Brett was interested in doing something. Um, they shot a sizzle for TV actually initially. And I think because of Woody not being involved in it, that got just shut down. Yeah. Um, you know, so I, I, some time passed and then my friend Andrew brought this to me and he was like, Hey, you know, this didn't go as a TV project, but I'm thinking about getting into podcasts. Um, would you be interested in producing this, like show running this, 
you know, as a podcast. And at the time I hadn't done podcasting before, but obviously, you know, and this was probably, I'm trying to, trying to think of the date, uh, like what year it was probably 2017, 2018, 2018. I think it was a couple of years before we actually released the podcast. Um, but you know, at that point I had listened to, you know, serial was the first podcast that I had like really gotten into. Um, and the true crime thing was, you know, it was interesting. I was, I was into it. I was like, this stuff's pretty fascinating. Um, and the ability to look into a case and, you know, have that kind of, because you don't know, sometimes when you have cameras rolling on people, they, they stiffen up a little bit, they get yeah. a little tight. Um, they become very self-conscious there, are, you know, there's bright lights on them. If you're lighting this thing. Um, whereas with a podcast, you can go in there and it can be really, it could be low key. I mean, we use the mics that we used for this thing are lavalier mics. They just like clip on your shirt, yeah, clip little on. tiny mic. Yep. yep. And people just forget you're even wearing a mic and you're just hanging out and you're talking, you know, and um, it can, you know, people let their guard down and they start talking to you, you know? And I think in the crime space, what's so interesting is like, there's things that people won't say to cops, you know, people don't, you know, people don't always trust cops, yeah. but if you're going in, right. And you're going in and you're, you know, you're meeting people on their level. You're not trying to set them up for anything. They're willing to talk to you and they're willing to tell you things that they might not have told people in the past. So anyway, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going off on a tangent here, but uh, so Andrew and I, we, we, we adjusted this pitch deck that he had um, to make it, you know, for a podcast Uh I had, you know, he was like, would you also want to host it potentially at the time I had never hosted anything before. So I was like, all right, maybe, <laughs> you know, do I want to be the host investigator? Maybe we'll see. Um, and then, you know, I did some audio samples. We ended up, he partnered up with uh, this guy, Scott Bernstein, who uh, was a producer on straight out of Compton. I was about to say, I, I thought that was him because I actually know another Scott Bernstein. And when I heard you say his name at the end of the credits, I sent him a text and I was like, were you fucking involved in this? And you didn't tell me. And he's like, I don't even know what you're talking about. And I'm like, well, it must be another Scott Bernstein. He said, probably the one that done straight out of Compton. And yeah. I was like, okay. Yeah. So Scott helped, it helped to sell it, you know, having Scott involved. Um, we sold it to Spotify, gave us a budget for it. Um, you know, at that point I had to do some audio samples and things just so they could say, okay, is this guy capable of hosting this thing? So and then we went for it. have done the, I'm sorry to cut you off, but I was no. talking about this myself. How much did y'all have put together when you pitched it to Spotify? Sure. At that point we had a pitch deck. Uh, we had an outline. There was like a rough outline. Right. Um, a list of, you know, at that point I had done some research myself. There were a few books. There were basically like pieces of these, this story in different places, but nobody had sort of brought it all together and made one coherent story out of it, you know? Um, and so I had read a few books on the subject to just familiarize myself with the world a little bit and had an idea as to people who I might want to reach out to if we were to make this thing. So I had like, you know, my wish list of here's who I would like to talk to. Um, and then I think we made an audio sample, which was like almost like a trailer for what the podcast would be. I'm trying to remember. I don't think we had any audio recorded with Brett at that point. Um, yeah, we didn't. I think we had just done like the outline pitch deck uh, and some kind of an audio sizzle. Okay. Um, you know, it's interesting cause I, like Spotify, I just saw something that Spotify is not doing original programming anymore for podcasts. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, it, it, you know, Spotify was, there was a lot of turnover happening while we were there. We went through like several execs, um, before we even got started. Um, and their original Spotify studios doesn't even exist anymore, which is kind of a shame. I mean, we've got, I think we're 15 followers away from reaching a hundred thousand followers. That's people who have clicked, like follow the page. Right. Um, and we've got like 3 million listens, 3 million streams, I think at this point. Um, so it's like, there's a, there's a, a, a feed there, the son of a hitman feed. So, you know, it's a shame if they don't do anything with it. Um, I agree. but Hey, so they uh, so, pick it up and you guys get rolling. So they pick it up. We get rolling. First interview was Brett. Um, you know, and at that point, actually, we were, you know, we had some people who were like, 
consultants who worked in radio and podcasting previously, like NPR type stuff, who had told us, oh, you're going to want to use this mic setup. And there were these like big like reporter microphones that you would like, you know, hold it out in front of somebody's face. Like, hey, you know, Jason Kavanaugh with the podcast. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're, we use that for the first interview with Brett, where we had these like mics set up on a table at a restaurant in Venice, in Venice Beach, uh, California. And it felt pretty awkward. And then we ended up bringing on a guy to edit the podcast. And we had only done that interview at that point. And he had done uh, the show To Live and Die in L.A., which was about a woman who went missing in Los Angeles. She was like an aspiring actress and it turned out her boyfriend had killed her. Um, but it was this true crime thing. Uh, and Alex, he was, you know, 24, 25 at the time had edited that. And so we brought him on and he was like, and Andrew and I had already thought like, I wonder if we should just use love mics. Cause like, if you're working in television, that's usually what you're using. Right. Um, but you usually have, have a sound guy you've got like a crew of people you know so it was just like is this complicated i don't know how and he's like no you just get a zoom mic um it's a little handheld thing like this big it's got a mic on the end of that that picks up like nat sound from the environment and then you plug the two love mics into that you know i would wear a love whoever i was interviewing would wear a love and you just you're rolling you could walk and talk with that thing um yeah. And like I said, it's really inconspicuous and you can sort of just get into a flow of a conversation. People forget that they're even wearing the mic, you know, yeah. does it go down and does it hook into like a box? You usually just throw it on your belt clip or something like yeah, that. It's like, they... yeah, it's like a thing like this big yeah. that the wire yeah. clips into. And then there's another one of those. That's the receiver that plugs into the, uh, the zoom mic. Yeah. But yeah, what... great, great. For a set recording. Of those. We've done a, uh, we've done a walk and talk with a guy in New York and they're, they're great. I mean, like you said, the audio is, is perfect then it, it's not yeah to me i think you have to look at obviously you didn't have to worry about visual distractions but this was going on video so sometimes big gaudy mics and stuff like that that can take away from what you're trying to put in front of the audience so the the like you said those little lapel mics are perfect yeah it was great and also just i was doing a lot of this by myself you know the first interview with brett we had a researcher came along and andrew came along um but from there on out I was, I was going solo. I was flying solo. So to be carrying around a bunch of big microphones and things, it wasn't going to work. Um, and, you know, using this really compact setup, I was able to, you know, so from that point forward, you know, we got that interview with Brett and then I started lining up my interviews that I was going to do across Texas, basically. Cause a lot of the story took place in Texas. Charles Harrelson was from Texas. Right. So I sort of plotted out, um, you know, here's my wish list. Let me start the outreach. And I got really fortunate that a lot of the people who I reached out to wanted to talk, um, you know, wanted to tell this story. And, you know, also I would I would speak to one person and then they would say, oh, you know who you should talk to. And there was a lot of that going on, too, yeah, where people were word, word of mouth traveling. Totally. Totally. And, you know, I was respectful and people, you know, people wanted to talk. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. You kind of cover his first murder of a, a carpet salesman. How did you even get into his, well, I'd say alleged because he didn't actually get charged for it. So I want right. to speak correctly. Or he's charged, but not convicted. Yeah. Right? Charged, not convicted. Right. Um, how did you even find out like that? That was a, a potential victim of his at first. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, you do a quick, search for the guy and that and it comes up that he was you know charged with or accused of you okay. know charged with the murder of allenberg um found not guilty uh but sort of ended there and then i did a little bit more digging and i found there was a book written by the brother of allenberg david berg and it was about it's called run brother run and it's about the murder of his brother um and it's a great book like a really really powerful book david's a very intelligent guy he went on to be a very successful attorney um and you know for me i was like i read that book and i was like oh man i hope i can get this guy because this would be huge um otherwise you know there was a book written by gary cartwright called dirty dealing about yeah the judge Wood assassination. So that, and that, I mean, that goes deep. It goes into like deep into the Chagra family. It's not even really about Charles Harrelson. He's a character 
along right. the way in that thing. Well, his um, daughter wrote one that kind of counter went against that dirty darlings, right? Yes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> right. And so I found that as well. Kathy, Kathy Chagra had written dirty darlings. I read that as well. Um, it, it's quick. But, how you can go down rabbit holes with just going into one thing in mind. Like I got here, I got to you. I got to, Je I got all that by, you know, watching a trailer for this movie called cocaine bear that said based on true events. And I'm like, what? No way. And, you know, just start investigating. And then it, it led me here. So it's crazy how one, you know, thing you start investigating can lead you down a rabbit hole that just spawns so many different ways. Oh man. And I could have spent 10 years on this, to be honest with you. Like there were avenues that I went down paths that I went down that didn't make it into the podcast because it just felt so far out there. Yeah. I mean, Danny Sheehan, who was the attorney who I spoke to in the first episode, mentioned something about this DEA agent in Mexico City who ended up getting arrested in El Paso and then choked to death on a peanut butter sandwich. And he thought he was involved. So then I started looking into this guy. I found his ex-wife or his, his widow had written a book about him. I read that book. It turned out, I don't think he had any relation to the Judge Wood case, but it was this really interesting story about this guy. He had been undercover for the DEA. He found a bunch of corruption in Mexico. You know, I mean, if you look into Mexico, like the vice president at the time was like in with the cartels, you oh, know, yeah. it's 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 wild. So, you know, so this DEA age and he's trying to like uncover this corruption and they're like, no, you're not. <laughs> um. And, which is a fascinating story, but it's like, oh, that's so far from Charles Harrelson and the story we're telling here. Let yeah, me refocus. You, and you have to veer off to give it context, but if you're not careful, you can veer way far off the initial story to begin with. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, I think it was the second episode, if I'm not mistaken, I could be wrong, but you detail a business card that supposedly charles would carry was this an actual fucking business card how do you fit all yeah. that business card yeah so i i've seen the business card it's actually in david berg's book run brother run is a, a a copy of the photo card it is it's wild you know if it wasn't for the overt racism on it it would be a great business card <laughs> and it's a shame that he's got like a horrible racist thing on there because otherwise it's funny you know, he hands me uh, his business card and he handed me a card. I mean, he was a nice guy when you met him, but I remember he gave me his card. The card reads wars fought, revolutions started, assassinations plotted, governments run, uprisings quelled, women seduced, tigers tamed, bars emptied, computers verified, orgies organized, used cars, land, beer, manure, nails, fly swatters, racing forms, bongos, pool, dry holes, sports cars, setups, broads, bets. And one more thing that I'm not going to say. And the card said, hired killer, murder for hire, n shot free. And I think to him it was funny, but it's like, oh man. Do you do you even remember some of the things that was on that fuck? I mean, it was went for a minute. I may have to take oh, it from you saying it and stick it in here on the, the yeah, it's, side of things, but it's it's like it was revolution nuts. started, uh, holes dug, like it's 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 insane. But uh, it's uh, insane. Threesomes negotiated or something, like that or something. <laughs> basically, it's wild and it goes on and on and on and on, and it's like you know. The concept of it going? is fun. I was like, there's no way this dude's serious. Like, this is, oh. not, I mean, was it front and back? It had to be front and back. It may have been front and back. I'm trying to remember. I think it was front and back, but the one side may have just said, like, Charles V. Harrelson. Oh. Um, it's, yeah, it, I'm having to get that. I knew that there was no way you could remember all that because it was just a slew of shit that was on that car. But when I'm, I'm driving and I'm just like, my mouth was dropping open. I was listening while I was driving in the car. I'm like, who the hell in the right mind would even carry a business card that said all that? Well, and if you're going, you know, one point that some people raised was like, if you're going around killing people, do you really want a business card that says I will kill people for you? Yeah. <laughs> Which is valid. Yeah. You know, probably not a great idea. I don't know how that would go over now, but I guess you could say it's a joke, right? Um, um is that was the consensus from the people you know, that you talked to, uh, in relate, what was his name? The victim? I'm sorry. Allenberg. Allenberg. Okay. 
was the consensus that they do believe that Charles had something to do with it. Cause it was, it was kind of rumored that, uh, and, and all these names have been blurred together. So no, I understand Yeah, the yeah. other guy that I think asked or either hired Charles to do it, he could have possibly done it as well. And I think he refused to talk to you, right? He refused to talk, you know, he had no comment. There was a woman who reached out to me at the end. You know, it was interesting as the podcast episode started airing, more people started coming out of the woodwork yeah. with new information and saying, hey, I, I have a story for you. Um, and one of them was this woman who knew Frank Di Maria, who was the man who, who some people believed may have hired Charles Harrelson. As the story went, he was complaining about this problem he was having with this carpet salesman owing him money uh, and... Charles Harrelson threw the card, the business card down on the table and said, I could take care of this for you. Um, and so this woman who knew Frank Di Maria said that she was, she was friends with him at one point and they were hanging out and I think they were both like intoxicated and he had sort of a teary eyed confession where he said, I shot that boy, according to this woman. Um, you know, I reached out to him for comment on that. He had no comment. Uh, you know, whether that means he literally pulled the trigger or whether he felt responsible, who knows? She was under the impression that, yes, she thought that he did it. Um, that being said, I spoke to Charles Harrelson's ex-girlfriend, Sandra Sue Attaway, who has since passed away. Uh, but she said, you know, she was there. She witnessed it. She said she watched Charles Harrelson shoot Ellen Burke. Um, yeah, you know, I mean, and she very, had very know, compelling police. stuff. I mean, the other yeah. he could have been there. Maybe maybe he just felt responsible for who knows. Yeah. I mean, according to Sandra Sue Attaway, it was just her and Charles in the car. They drove drove Allenberg out to a remote area just outside Galveston, uh, like a swampy area. And, and, and he shot him out there. And that's where you he know. stayed for a while before they found him. Right. Yeah, he was in that area. He committed, you know, the next murder he was charged with, uh, this grain dealer, Sam DeGilia. Mm -hmm. um, that was only like a year or so later, I want to say, that that murder took place. And, you know, that was in a different part of Texas, but it was that they flew out. They flew out there to see him. Um, and see, I mean, we're, we're 20 minutes into this show. We've talked about this guy assassinating a federal judge, possibly having some sort of connection to JFK, killing, you know, two different individuals because he's a hitman for hire. But by all accounts, everybody that talked about him said he was a very likable guy, very charismatic, good with the ladies, like hard not to the, like you would have to want to dislike him basically, unless you were just on his shit list. And I guess that's be a different experience. But as far as just knowing him personally, seemed like a likable dude. Yeah. You know, I've talked to Abel Ferrara, who the director, Abel Ferrara, he, yeah. you know, directed Bad Lieutenant. Yeah. He's done a King lot of stuff with Lasarda, who we talked about before we had. Uh -huh. Yeah. King of New York. Yeah. Uh, and he had met with him in prison because he, he had directed a documentary about the assassination of the judge like 10 years after the fact. And he said, cool guy. I really liked him. Uh, you know, I think he's charismatic. You know, Woody Harrelson's very charismatic. If you believe the latest, the latest hype, uh, Matthew McConaughey is saying it could be his dad as well. I mean, those are a couple of charming guys, you know? Yeah. I seen so, that after me and you spoke last Friday, I Googled that cause I had not heard that. Um, and I've seen that within the news where he said, and I want to say that basically the story is, Matthew's mom did have a hiatus from his dad at the time and apparently did see Charles Harrison. Then I guess reconnected with his dads and they don't look that far off, especially as, as babies. I mean, there is some similarities there. This thing doesn't, uh, isn't yeah. exactly very far fetched. I'm assuming it could probably be easily proven with a DNA test. Right. What they want to take it that far, but. Right. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's a tough one. I can't tell if they're just trying to hype their new show or if there's like some truth to it. It's a weird one, but um, yeah, I mean, I think he was a charming guy. Uh, you know, I've heard people say he was, you know, these aren't uh, psychologists, but they're saying they think he was a sociopath or a psychopath that yeah. just no, you know, no emotion about. And he said like shooting somebody is like shooting a watermelon right. human heads, like a watermelon, you know? When you first started digging into this, as far as Charles Harrelson was concerned, 
when did you start getting introduced to the Chagras and, and all of their inner dealings in this, because they have a, a, a huge role in this too. I mean, you know, Jimmy Lee, Joe, I mean, all those play a part in this. When did you start kind of diving into them and did you know anything about them previously? Yeah. So I had read dirty dealing and that goes deep into the Chagra family. Um, and you so I was a, prior to this, or you read it after you started, after I start, after I was introduced to the story by okay. my friend, Andrew, I then read dirty dealing pretty, okay. you know, pretty immediately, you know, I read the outline, watched his, the sizzle that he had done. And I was like, I'm going to dig into this, uh, read dirty dealing, which goes deep into the Chagra family. What's interesting is, you know, Gary Cartwright is the author of dirty dealing there's all these nicknames for characters like uh, Lee Chagra, who was Jimmy Chagra's older brother. He was an attorney, like a very accomplished defense attorney, criminal defense attorney in El Paso. And Gary Cartwright says that he's known as the black striker. And he's like, he describes him as he has this cane and he has like, I think a belt buckle that says black striker. And he's this like over the top character, like gambling millions of dollars at a time. And then I talked to his son, Lee Chagra's son, Leader Chagra, Lee Jr. And he's like, that name was bullshit. He, he wasn't called the Black Striker. Gary Cartwright made that shit up. <laughs> <laughs> now, when you met with him, didn't y'all go to kind of some unsavory parts of town there? Because I remember hearing that. Even your PI told you, it was like, I don't know if I'd go there and mess around all kind of way. What, so, like? so when I first talked to Leader, so actually I got in touch with the Chagra's you know, I had done outreach, but I hadn't found all of those people. And then our researcher associate, slash associate producer, Deborah Correa, she tracked down leader Chagra first. I think I had gotten in touch with Kathy Chagra. Right. I, maybe I had found her book. I can't remember exactly what it was, but I got in touch with her. She really wanted to talk. And she was like, I could probably get my sister Krista to come along. Um, then my researcher found Lee Chagra and while I was in Texas, actually, I think she found him. I was already, I think I was in San Antonio at the time. I sort of did. My Texas route was like Dallas to Love Lady, where Charles was born. Then Houston, Van Horn. He had the standoff, like a cocaine-induced standoff with the police where he confessed to the assassination of JFK yeah. and he was hallucinating and whatever. Uh, then Midland, where I met Jordan Harrelson, then San Antonio, where the judge was assassinated and all those people were located, and then on to El Paso. And so while I was in San Antonio, Deborah, my researcher, put me in touch with Lee Chagra. So I call him and the first thing he does is he's like doing this like accent when I call him on the phone. He was like prank. He was like pranking me. The first time I talked to him on the phone, like this guy's a live wire, you know. I remember it. that was in the podcast. What is I think it's in the well, podcast. Yeah, yeah, because I was like, I was, oh, "This is gonna be an interesting conversation." And then he just completely changed, right? And he's like, and he's he had she told me, you know, he just he had ser he he served seventeen years in prison for a cocaine sentence, um, for cocaine distribution. You know, he'd been out for a little bit. It fell right um, into the family business there. <laughs> yeah, right. You know, and he was a young guy when his, his uncle went to prison. His dad was murdered. Yeah, his, his dad, dad, Lee dad Chagra, which is yep. its own its own story that we didn't get too deep into. But that's a, a crazy story in and of itself. Yeah, Jimmy um, went into detail a little bit on that, about all the money that was there. He was supposed to be transporting to Jimmy. It was kind of dumb luck that it was there. I think his uh, his assistant possibly could have had a hand in getting some of that money because he didn't really uh, call 911 immediately mm -hmm. after it happened. There was, a, you can get deep in the weeds on that one too. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So when I talked to leader that first time, he was like, Oh, I'll take you into Juarez. It's right across the border. Could be fun. We'll go out there, have some drinks, have a good time, whatever. I'm like, Hey, I'm game, whatever, you know? So then I talked to, I tell my people back in LA, Hey, you know, I think I'm going to go meet with leader Chagra in El Paso. And I think we're going to go into Juarez. And they were like, Whoa, don't go into Juarez. That's like an incredibly dangerous city. Like one of the most dangerous cities in Mexico. Cause it's right on the border. The cartels are just right there. And yeah. then I, I found that the week prior, a journalist had been murdered in, El, in Juarez. Whoa. And so I was like, all right. And I talked to our private investigators who were in Texas and they were like, listen, if you go be the gray man, you know, blend in. I mean, I got recording devices and microphones and shit. <laughs> <laughs> I 
but be the gray man. <laughs> if you do get abducted, fight like hell. Cause if they take you to a second location, it's not going to be pretty. And I was like, I was like, all right, fuck that. I'm not, I'm not going to war. <laughs> no, thank you. Yeah. I remember when you said that in the, in the show, it was like, go ahead and make them kill you there. Cause if they take you to a secondary <laughs> location, this is, you're going to wish they would have killed you. Right. I'm like, all right, you know what? This is probably not worth it. You know what? But that being said, once I was there with leader Chagra, I was like, I'd probably be fine. And I'm, you know what? I'm sure it would have been fine, but it's also one of those like why tempt fate. Yeah. If you can get a, a, a decent interview without having to go into that fucking area, well, I'd go ahead. And, get and then there were other people who I still wanted to interview. And I only had a couple of days in El Paso. And like, I wanted to talk to his aunt Patsy, who was, you know, Jimmy and Lee's sister who was around for all of this. She's like the Carmela Soprano of the Chagra family, you know? Uh, and then Richard Esper was this guy who had represent. He was an attorney who was friends with Lee Chagra, who had he had repped Charles Harrelson for like a day when he first got picked up in Van Horn after his cocaine fueled rant about how he killed JFK and whatever. And Richard Esper was like, "Yeah, he told me he killed JFK. He was trying to use it as like a bargaining chip to get out of to get out of jail." And he's like, "I don't think they're going to let you go for saying that you killed JFK." <laughs> Yeah, that's not a get out of jail free card. <laughs> well, I guess it depends on who you're talking to, you right? And how much jail, legitimacy man. you got it, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so anyway, so it was like, you know what? El pa or, or Juarez, not in the cards. Also, just when I first met with Leader, I walked into a restaurant and he's sitting there drinking a martini and he's got this like giant Mexican dude there <laughs> who barely said a word. Which I actually, you know, just for theatrics, I enjoyed it. And the guy was very nice too. And he was like, oh, he would come with us if we go into Juarez. He's my driver. I'm like, all right. Oh, well, you feel a little bit better with that. Totally. <laughs> um, getting into like all these guys in Vegas. So there was, you know, what was the guy? Treetop something or another? Yeah, Jack, Jack Treetop Strauss. Jack uh, Treetop Strauss, Benny Binion, all these names. If you've ever, you could dive into Benny Binion and have a, your own podcast. I mean, I don't know totally. how you dove into him. Yep. But I mean, he was a hell of a character in and of himself, you know, outside of all these guys. Yep. What was kind of the connection? Did a lot of these guys play at Binion's Casino? Did they know each other? I know you so, said Treetop Strauss was kind of a money man and, and used Charles for muscle. What was kind of that connection? Yeah. So as I understand, you know, Charles grew up in Love Lady, Texas, East Texas. Um, you know, it's north of north of houston you know not too far from houston uh dallas houston sort of like i think it like triangulates between the two of them and uh you know binion was set up somewhere in east texas and it's like east texas and new orleans are not far right, right. um so you have this like gambling you know dixie mafia the gambling circuit going on around there jack treetop strauss i think he was the first champion of the world series, world of, series poker. of poker it was like yeah. early days world series of poker also jack treetop strauss he was six foot seven so i think he was just cheating like he could see people's yeah, cards see everybody else's shit and he's that was held at seven. binion's too i think right wasn't the yeah. person held at binion's? yeah i think i think binion was the guy who who started the world series of poker uh the story that i heard was binion got ran out of texas or ran out of east texas and that's how he ended up in vegas and setting up uh I can't remember the name of the casino that he set up out there. It was Binion's. Oh, it was Binion's. Okay. Yeah, it's right. called Binion's. Yeah. Okay. There you go. I, I was actually in Vegas a few months ago. First time I'd ever been, believe it or not, at uh, 39 years of age. And I stayed on Old Vegas on Fremont Street. And as I was walking down, I seen that. And I'm like, holy shit, that's Binion's. So, there yeah, a lot of story you can dive in with, with him. Like I said, and that's completely a whole nother rabbit hole in and of itself. But I'm surprised. All these stories that we've talked about, there's not been some sort of movie or, or documentary made. I maybe can understand that Woody's maybe putting the kibosh on some of this stuff involving his dad, but even guys yeah. like Benny Binion, I mean, it's just fascinating totally. stuff. It's fascinating. It, it It is. And I think, you know, what I was told was that Charles Harrelson and this guy, Larry Colbreth, who was a friend of his, were basically muscle for Binion. They were working for Binion. They ended up out in Vegas and I think it was around that same time that Binion had left East Texas and went out to Vegas. So I do think there was a correlation there with Harrelson ending up out in Vegas. You know, in his um, 
in his testimony for the assassination of Judge Wood, he goes into, I mean, you know, there were like 10, I think it was 10,000 pages of uh, documents from that trial. It went on and on and on. So obviously I couldn't include everything, right. but one of the, some, just his testimony was fascinating. And one of the things he was talking about was this like, basically like a heist that they were pulling in Vegas where they had gotten a hold of uniform dealer uniforms for I think it was Caesar's Palace and they had set up tables in a hotel room in Caesar's and they were getting like you know people with a lot of money to come up and play in the room and they were ripping them off basically and that's what he says he was doing in Vegas when he supposedly met Jimmy Chagra for the first time yeah because he by all accounts was a card shark a hustler they would use you know, Mark Dex, loaded dice, things of that nature. So that that story probably sounds right up to Ali. And he was right, yeah. a fan of of Jimmy Chagra because some of the things that I read on him was even though it didn't mean a hill of beans if he lost, he wasn't the greatest gambler. I think he just did it just for fun. Yeah. But he would blow hundreds of thousands, if not millions, and and not bad at eyes. So everybody loved him. Dealers loved him, and and everybody. He also you have to imagine he's dealing in cash. Yeah, you got to do something with it. You got to do something with it. You got to launder it. Gambling's a good way to launder money and to just get some of it. You have too much and you just have to get rid of some of it. Yeah. So yeah, he would tip big, gamble big. And yeah, they said that the loved waitresses it. loved him. He would walk in and throw suitcases total and say it's around a quarter of a million and it might be four or 5,000 over. And he just tell the count people to keep it. Just give him a the quarter million marker and, you know, let him go play. Good friends to have around. <laughs> I need some friends like that. <laughs> I'm telling you. Yeah. And uh, so it's it's kind of rumored that around this time, there's an attempt assassination on a district attorney judge, uh, not judge, but James, a district attorney. Curry, yeah. um, mm -hmm. He survives. And him, you actually getting him, he tells the story pretty vividly. Another one where I was kind of, it felt like I was in the back seat of that car, the way he was explaining it. You know, he's seen the van, happened to bend over to pick up some stuff. And, you know, survived. I would love to see pictures of that car because it doesn't sound yeah. like you thought he survived at all. The photos of the, I've seen photos of the car. It's got bullet, it's riddled with bullet holes. Um, yeah, he's, it, that was an interesting one because he really did not, you know, I, I wasn't hyping anything when it was like, he doesn't want me to reveal his location. Right. I, I, our private investigator was able to find, I think an email address for him. Uh, email address or phone number or something, which I tried. And he was a little, he was a little sketched out initially and just making sure, you know, who, who are we, you know, he's a guy like that'll give you PTSD. Oh, yeah. <laughs> You've been targeted in an assassination. That's scary. Um, and I think all these years later, he's still vetting anybody that wants to get in contact with him. This oh yeah. You know, 40 some odd years later. <laughs> yeah, and his conditions where you can't reveal my location, I uh, can't give any indication as to where I am, um, you know, which I was happy happy to do. I was happy to hear him, you know, to have him tell his story. Yeah. Crazy. So when the attempted assassination happened on him, did Wood kind of take over? Is that how that transition happened? or what? No, so, so Kerr was the assistant U.S. district attorney um, for the Western District of Texas. Judge Wood was the judge presiding over the Western District of Texas. So basically, like any time there was a case coming before Judge Wood, Kerr was one of the prosecutors who was oftentimes prosecuting it. So okay. they would kind of work hand in hand. You know, it would be and Judge Wood was known as Maximum John because yep. he would give the maximum sentence on drug charges. Uh, they're both sort of, you know, very Texas, religious, conservative um anti-drug you know and which is why they were you know a thorn in the side of people who were smuggling drugs mm -hmm. <laughs> who, who didn't particularly like these two you know also uh from what i remember leader shogger was saying his his father lee and kerr like did not like each other that they kind of butt heads um you know because lee shogger was a, a defense attorney very big on on civil rights civil liberty civil liberties and then you've got these really right-wing prosecutor and judge kind of working hand in hand uh 
to shut that stuff down. And it sounds like Lee often got the better of, and, you know, James Kerr told me, you know, Lee was, Lee Shogger was a very good attorney, very talented attorney. He had good things to say about him. Um, but I think after Lee was murdered, then Jimmy, and listen, Jimmy was found not guilty for hiring Charles Harrelson to assassinate Judge Wood. That being said, people told me that once his brother died, that was sort of his like, his armor, his protection, yeah. you know, it was always Lee could get me out of this. If I get myself into a jam now, his brother's dead and you've got this very strict judge and prosecutor. And, you know, the, the story that people say allegedly is that, you know, he, he was, he was concerned about that. Yeah. Which would, would have been his motivation had he done it. You know? Yeah. I think you told a story that Lee even got, I think like a guy off for shooting a cop. Like he got the guy off for shooting. That was probably yeah. a, uh, back in those days. Yeah. Yeah. I actually, and I had a uh, leader provided audio recordings of his dad in the yeah, courtroom. I heard really, that. really cool. We had to do some work to clean those up because they were old, you yeah. know, and on like cassette tapes, but um, that was pretty cool. Yeah. I mean, yeah. he sounds like quite a character and for Jimmy to have him, like you said, until he ultimately did get assassinated as his attorney, the next one that he had wasn't no slouch either. And Oscar Goodman, he's the one that ultimately yeah. had played a huge role in getting that conviction of that judge overturned. But one thing I wanted to get into before we get into that. So Jimmy is in prison for 30 years for the drug sentence. Yeah. While he's in prison, they have the, the meeting room bug with his family. Supposedly, this is for an entirely different reason. I think it had something to do with Nick Savella, if I'm not mistaken, out of Kansas City. Okay. But they pick up the conversation of the assassination of this judge. Is that how it went down? Something like that. I know that they, they got wiretaps and they were, they were wiretapping the Chagras all over the place. They eventually got, so the Chagras, there's Lee Chagras, the oldest brother. Then you have Jimmy. No, no. I think Pat's, he might be the next in age. And then Joe Chagra was the youngest brother. He also became an attorney, um, but, you know, nowhere in the league of his older brother, Lee. Right. And Joe, he was kind of, he was a big partier. You know, Jimmy's obviously like this huge drug smuggler. His older brother is like, you know, drug kingpin. And it's like, and he's, he's the younger the brother. And he's moment. exactly, he's having a good time. And uh, from what I understand, they had... Jimmy and Joe on wiretap. Joe was the one who I think Charles was like ingratiating himself to Joe. Right. And hanging around Joe in El Paso after the judge had been assassinated. And I think was putting the pressure on Joe to get the money for the assassination that had taken place, allegedly. Right. right. And, uh, they got Joe on tape with Jimmy saying something about he did the thing or I, I can't remember the exact the exact wording, but it was something where like Joe realized in the room when they played the audio for him that he was fucked. Yeah. And then they got him to cooperate, but he was only willing to cooperate against Charles Harrelson. He wasn't willing to testify against his brother. And that was how they got him to cooperate which is why Charles Harrelson got found guilty. Jimmy was did he not. acting as his lawyer because like that. I mean, I so fall, that's I fall under attorney client privilege. So what the hell is going on there? So it was the sort of thing where they were like, I, I think the way they got around that where they were like, he wasn't actually acting as, as his attorney. He didn't like do the pro take the proper steps. I think it was sort of like they're on Coke. They go into a bathroom and they start having a conversation. And it's like, well, technically I'm a lawyer. So yeah, I'm your lawyer. I think it was one of those things. Okay. Um, you know, there were, there were some other things that, that did sort of stretch those limits a bit where I was talking to this guy, Don Irvin, who was representing Charles. Uh, he didn't end up ultimately, I think he got five. I think Charles fired him at some point before the trial. Uh, either fired or quit or they, they went their separate ways regardless. Um, and he was saying that in the visiting room, they had Charles found a tape recorder under the table, like at the visiting glass when he was like, there talking to his girlfriend or ex-wife or whatever it was. Um, and 
but he they had also been it had been there during his conversations with his attorney as well and I, I forget what the prosecutor, Ray Young, the prosecutor, told. He had some workaround for what. Oh, we weren't recording when he was there with the attorney. It was only with the wife and blah, blah, blah. I was like, oh, come on. Yeah. <laughs> well, you got to think, too, when the, a federal judge is assassinated, because they, they kind of played it to really, I think, maybe a diversion. I think, obviously, whoever done that probably did slash his wife's tire he sees that he goes to change it. He's he's shot. So it was it was a, a well planned out hit. So when that happens, they're gonna cut and bend everything they can bend to to make somebody take the fall for it. They can't let that go un no unf- I mean, that's too much unfinished business. They can't let that go unanswered. Somebody's gonna pay for that. Yeah. Yeah. Whether yeah. it's the right guy or the wrong guy, somebody's gonna go down. Yeah. Now, and and then everything I've spoken with Jimmy about this and then, you know, my own research, I know another name came up that wasn't really associated with this when you spoke with Jimmy, but by all accounts, what I've kind of pieced together in between your shows and other things that I've read, Jimmy was the kind of guy that, I mean, he talked big. So he's like, you know, I basically in, in general conversation, maybe, you know, I'd pay for somebody to take this fucking judge out, whether Charles heard that or where it got back to him, you know, I've also heard that Charles did not actually do it. Somebody else did it. But once it was done, Charles was like, hey, tell him I took care of that. So I need my money. So he took credit for it, but didn't actually do it. When you spoke with Jimmy, he drops a name by the name, a uh, guy by the name of Little Larry. What is your best guess of how this all played out? Yeah, it's interesting because I think, uh, you know, ultimately, I think Charles Harrelson did not have adequate counsel yeah. in this trial, right? I think he probably should have gotten off given some of the irregularities in the investigation, in the way things went down. That being said, I think he was involved. Uh, I think he was probably there. Um, do I think he... I don't think he acted alone. I think this was a group of people who conspired to do this. I don't think that, I think it was a fairly well planned out assassination. I think this was like, yeah, I think this was a a conspiracy among some people to, to carry this thing out. Um, Right. Larry Colbert's name came up, you know, I'm not going to say, I think he did it. I don't, you know, I, I, I don't know. I wasn't there. I, you know, but there are people who said that, they believe he did it. Um, Whether he was just there, you know, Jack Dean, the Texas Ranger who had, who was familiar with Charles Harrelson's cases. He had worked the two previous murders. Uh, He, he said to me that someone saw someone the day of the assassination, someone saw someone in a car that I think was Charles's car that fit the description of little Larry. Um, You know, one thing that was interesting is in just looking through old newspapers, there were all these uh, drawings of suspects that were seen, like suspicious characters that were seen around the scene of the crime. And it it ran the like these suspects, it ran the gamut. So it's it's funny that ultimately they said, oh, it was Charles Harrelson. And we put together this sketch based on this eyewitness. Um, and that was what made it to trial. But meanwhile, there's all these other sketches that were floating around that were like out in the newspapers. And I, so it's bizarre. I do think, you know, if they were going to assassinate a federal judge, you're going to have some lookouts. You're going to have some. They also found a ladder up against uh, one of the buildings. Ray Yan, the prosecutor, he walked me through the scene where the assassination had taken place. And he was like, they found a ladder right over here that led to the roof to this building, but you would have been able to see the judge's parking spot from from this roof but then they realized they they found that it didn't have anything to do with it i'm like what do you mean you don't have to know it? how do you know how do you know that like that to me was kind of bizarre i think there were things that just if it doesn't you know and i think this happens all the time right it's like they're trying to paint a picture they're trying to tell a narrative if something doesn't fit the narrative that they're telling they change let, let's ignore that. Don't look at that. Look over here. This is this is the narrative that we're telling. And I think that it's just there was more to it than the way than what they were able to prove um, and the case that they made against Charles Harrelson. I think there was more to it than that. Well, I totally agree that he probably did have ineffective counsel just based on the grounds of 
you know, I think Woody even stated this in his, uh, was a Barbara Walters interview. The guy that supposedly hired him gets off, but yet he's still in jail for the murder. So, I mean, that's that right there in and of itself probably should at least warrant a retrial. Fairly well known. If anybody's read anything about you or talked with you that when you were seven years old, your father went off to prison convicted of murder. Tell me how you feel today, what the story is today. Well, he is in prison right now for uh, the killing of a federal judge. Um, I think that it was not a fair uh, trial, especially because the guy who supposedly hired my father to commit the murder was uh, later acquitted on a retrial. Woody, do you think your father is innocent of that second murder? That's what I've heard. I'm not saying my father's a saint, but I think he's innocent of that, yeah. Are you trying to have the case opened up, trying to have it investigated, trying to set him free? Well, um, let's put it this way. I haven't given up hope. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You said once that you thought that your father was a CIA operative. Yes? Yeah, he was. How do you know? What proof? Ah, see, I shouldn't get into this right now. Okay. This is where we're going to get into trouble. Uh, but this is something that you feel and that you're trying to work on? Oh, I know it's true, but, uh, you know. Does it make a difference? That he was trained by the CIA? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it makes a difference. But, I mean, all the stuff involved with this, you know, you got the girl that supposedly hypnotized. I don't really know how well that would hold up in court these days. <laughs> um <laughs> There's a lot of shady stuff went on up there that I think people maybe overlooked or looked past or allowed just the situation being what it was. Yeah. I mean, so the hypnotized witness, she ended up suing um, after the podcast came out. You? Uh, oh, yeah. Me, Spotify, the podcast. Um, it was all dismissed, you know. Uh, so that was a relief, you know, first time being sued, first time for everything, right? Uh, but she sued for defamation. She said that we you know, uh, uh, that, that, that we made it seem like there was a conspiracy between her and the FBI. But like, I was very careful not to say that. Um, in fact, even gave her the benefit of the doubt to say, I think she might be mistaken about this Christopher Walken thing. That yeah. That not... was the one that said Christopher Walken done the documentary, but there was no reports of Christopher Walken doing that. And like you said, Abel Ferrara did do King of New York, which starred Christopher Walken. She could have gotten her wires crossed. I, I don't you know, know and who knows? Maybe Christopher Walken showed up on set one day and Abel Ferrara lied to me about it because he wasn't in the DGA. Who knows? Yeah. Who yeah. knows? She, it, it could have been real. It could have been Christopher Walken was there. I just find that if there's one person on this earth you can't mistake for anybody else, Christopher Walken would probably <laughs> be that person. That's <laughs> what I get. It's true. Man, I just, you know, and from, from my perspective, it was just, I want to talk to Christopher Walken for this podcast, you know? Yeah. It's a great podcast guest. Yeah. But, you know, uh, that was really... I was there. I, I, but, see that. <laughs> <laughs> I refrained from doing a Christopher Walken impersonation because I was like, you know what? I can't do it well enough. So I'm just gonna... Um, but, you know, I mean, I think what that whole thing went back to was like, you know, one of the statistics I found was the Innocence Project found that in cases that were overturned by DNA evidence since DNA got introduced, 73% of the overturned convictions, they were reliant upon two or more eyewitness testimonies. This case had one eyewitness testimony who was remembering things from a year prior when she finally was able to put the sketch together. You know, I think that it's just about the fact that like memory is not always 100% reliable, especially now we're talking about a case that took place 40 years ago. Right. And you then know, too, I mean, when, when it was Jimmy's trial, they brought up, uh, what was that? Ray James, Ray Edwards or Jimmy, no. Jimmy Ray James. Yeah. Jimmy Ray James. Yeah. yeah <laughs> All these yeah. names get or Jer <laughs> Jerry, Jerry Ray James. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Jerry Ray James and Oscar just, I mean, that was probably one of the greatest moves I'd ever seen. You know, he's like, okay, so you're, you're telling me Jimmy told you he killed this man. Oh, yeah, killed him. Yeah, did. And then the next day he brings the guy into the courtroom, puts him on the stand, and is like, you know, I must say, you look very good for a dead guy. I mean, that had to just send shockwaves through that courtroom. I would have loved to have either been on that jury or in that courtroom as a, as a reporter or somebody following that case. That had to be something to be seen. It's great theatrics. Yeah, well, he's that way anyway. Like, in my uh -huh. interview with him, just – some of the stuff that he was able to, some of the stuff that he said he'd done and 
you know, ways that he was able to get, you know, Tony Spilotra off of a bunch of stuff. I mean, he represented a lot of uh, organized crime figures, a lot of them. Man, I'm jealous that you got him. I couldn't I couldn't get get a, get a hold of him, which was a bummer because yeah, I really he, wanted to talk to him. He's quite a character, and I wish I would have known more details on this case when we had our episode. I didn't know that he had uh, defended. I didn't know a lot about this particular case when we done that interview, so I'll, I'll – I'd love for him to do a second one. I don't know if he will. That was kind of a favor to to someone else for doing that one. But it was it was a treat because, you know, he was even in Casino. He was in the real movie Casino playing his part in real life. Mm-hmm. So the, the lawyer that you see representing the Joe Pesci character, that was him. He was the actual lawyer that represented Tony Spilotra, the guy that, you know, was the basis of, of Joe Pesci's character. Uh, and then he went, uh, what run three consecutive terms as mayor. And I think his wife got mayor after that. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty so, amazing. Yeah. He's a historical career. Another charismatic guy. He said him and Jimmy, he I'll loved Jimmy. He said him and Jimmy got along very well. Um, all through all this, I know that it, you, you had to at least have hope that at some point you could get Woody involved in some way shape form and you got close did you not get close there we did get close yeah yeah it's like i got i became close with both brett and jordan woody's two brothers and um you know they brett was always like woody's not going to want to talk about this he's private about it just doesn't want to go into it jordan was like you know i think woody's going to want to hear some of the stuff that you've found because i don't think he knows all of this right and so, you know, I talked to his, Woody's got his assistant, Tracy has been with him for 30 years. Uh, no, she, you know, she knew a lot of the players involved, you know, she knew some of these lawyers who I've been talking to. Um, she was f- familiar with all this stuff. And, you know, I had two lengthy conversations with her, but ultimately she was like, listen, I'll pass this stuff on to Woody. I can't say that he's going to want to talk to you about it, but I'll pass it along to him and whatever. And, you know, and for even for me in making this, it was never like, I didn't want this to be like a tabloidy exploiting someone's celebrity. I right. think it's just, it's a fascinating story in and of itself without a celebrity, a celebrity's father being involved in this thing. It's just oh, it's a wild story. If you know? Woody was no way involved in this, if this guy's name was, you know, something totally different this story would be just as fascinating of this guy who, you know, supposedly killed this, you know, federal judge supposedly was mixed in with the JFK assassination. I mean, it's just, it screams movie TV show, documentary biopic. It right. screams that. And, right. and I've got to think that one of the only reasons it hasn't been done yet is because I guess the way you're going to portray it, if it's not, you know, the way Woody may would like, like it to be, he would put the kibosh on it. You know, listen, I think in doing a deep dive into this, Charles Harrelson is not, he's not, he's, it would be hard to paint him as some kind of a superhero, you know? And And I think he even said that in that interview, he said, my father's no saint. Right. Right. And so, but I guess you get into some details and it's, it's unpleasant, you know? And it's also, you know, and I respect it. It's very personal. And that's, you know, that's what she said. She's like, it's very personal for him. He just doesn't want to go into it. And I, you know what? I get it. Like Brett and Jordan are not celebrities. Like Brett was in the people versus Larry Flint. Like he's actually, I was going to say, I thought that was his real life brother. in the. (laughs) He's great. Larry Flint. He's great. in it. Yeah. But you know, he's not at that level of Woody Harrelson. And I think I get it. If you have people constantly up in your business and looking at you and whatever, and then this is your family member, it's just, I don't, I don't want that shit out there. I, you know, I mean, and then a week later, Matthew McConaughey comes out and says, I think I have the same dad, it, which was, it was weird. It was like a week later. I'm like, I don't even know what to make of this. Well, I know <laughs> when you asked you, when we first spoke, you asked me that I heard, had I heard about that and I hadn't I just, you know, think when I had first kind of dove into this whole thing, with the cocaine bear, I reached out to Jimmy jr. I found an, an interview he did with someone that didn't really, I don't think knew a lot of the facts about his father. He knew as loosely who his father was, but maybe wasn't as in tune as, as I had been because of the stuff I was researching. So I reached out to him and it was a while, I guess maybe it went to spam because we weren't friends on Facebook, but mm-hmm. I guess he seen the message request and he reached out and then that, you know, led me to you. And then I reached out to you. So it's just, it's funny how those things kind of like you doing your podcast, you know, you said you went down there mm-hmm. to speak to one person and they, oh, I know who you need to talk to. That was the same thing with Jimmy. And, 
you know, I can't stress enough. People need, if you're interested in the slightest about this kind of stuff, even if you're not, I mean, it's just a good story in general. You need to go check out son of the Hitman. Now that you, you mentioned earlier, Spotify back this, so this is Spotify exclusive. You're not going to be able to find it on any other avenues, but Spotify. Is that correct? That's right. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, I, I'd hope this thing continues to grow. I mean, I, what else have you got coming down the pipe? I mean, you got any projects you're working on any shows, podcasts, so, what's next? I just, so, uh, I just found out today, the last project that I worked on, we won a Webby award. Which is pretty exciting. It was, uh, this, this show called the walking dead, the last mile. It was a, uh, it was actually a web show for Facebook. Uh, it was a walking dead game like a, a mobile game. And then this was a live show to accompany the game where the audience could play the game and then influence the story based on their bids. Uh, and so we got like best audience uh, interactive experience or something like that. Um, so that was pretty exciting. Just won that today. Uh, and, you know, I've got a couple things in development that are more in line with, you know, what I had done on Son of a Hitman. One is a podcast project that's in very early stages, so I wouldn't want to say uh, what it is, but good, entertaining, uh, fascinating story, crime, Hollywood sort of a thing. Uh, and then I have a four-part doc series that we're pitching for TV um unrelated to this but another good one and yeah i got stuff in development waiting for hollywood to start bu start buying things again it's uh it's a very slow time right now across the board they're waiting for a writer's strike and all these things but yeah hopefully hopefully well they need up. new content man because i think it was yeah. at the oscars last year they said like a lot of the movies were you know either sequels or reboots from yeah. you know other stuff like the top gun and and stuff like we need new fresh content there's only original. so many times you could original yeah there's only yeah. so many times you can remake certain things i mean you're still even the creed that was i thought was very good you're still going off the rocky i mean top guns 2 still which i thought was another fabulous sequel still going off that we need original ideas i mean it's I just couldn't something agree more. we miss I couldn't agree more. It's it's a weird one. It's just they 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 see it as safe bets, you know. Yeah, say so that it's guaranteed. They don't want to take that risk. And and we talked before we hopped on air about you know landmark TV shows like The Sopranos, who I don't think at, at any at that point in time had anything was really like that on TV. And it was one of those first shows to where it was centered around this mob family, but they they made it normal like he had normal problems he had problems at home with his wife and his kids and his mother was driving him nuts but at the same time he had this crime family and it was just it was so good the casting was so good i miss tv like that that just sucked you in you get it here and there you know you get the the breaking bads and the the sons of anarchies and you you get you do get them it's not completely existent but it's nowhere near i think what tv was back in its its heyday and we drastically need to get back to that I couldn't agree more. And, uh, uh, you know, as someone who works in nonfiction television, I find that for me, I'm watching things and I'm like, this is no, no basis in reality whatsoever. People don't act like this. Any, like most of the cop shows you watch, they're like in these like fancy CSI crime labs. You're like, have you ever been in a police station? That's not yeah. what they look like. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> these are, these are publicly funded, you know, <laughs> you know, but I think, Right. Stuff that's based in, in reality and truth. And that's where for me, you know, a project like son of a Hitman or the other stuff that I have coming up, that's it's nonfiction stuff. That's real based in reality. It's, it's a great basis for scripted television, scripted movies, because it's, you know, it's real life. Absolutely. Real life is oftentimes way more interesting than the stuff that some writer can dream up. Oh, absolutely. 100%. Uh, tell all our listeners where they can go to track you down, any socials they can follow you on, things like that. Yeah, you can find me on Twitter, Jason Kavanaugh, uh, C A V A N A G H, no you. Uh, not like the Supreme Court Justice. Uh, you can find me on Instagram. I think I'm Jason underscore Kavanaugh. And uh, yeah, reach out. Uh, you know, my my website, Jason Kavanaugh.com. Um, but yeah, reach out if you have anything, uh, any great stories, true stories. I'm always, always open ears, always looking for new stuff. So absolutely well there you have it ladies and gentlemen i can't stress enough go out and check out son of a hitman exclusively on spotify damn it if hollywood tells you to go do it you need to do it you will not regret it one single bit hope you're listening to this podcast as well 
And Jason, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you stopping by the show, my friend. Hey, thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. Yes, sir. Well, I am Hollywood Wade. That was Jason Cavanaugh. And unfortunately, we are out of time. Tune in next week for an all new episode of Crime and Entertainment. Jason, we appreciate it, my friend. All right. Thank you.